Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Joe Thompson. I'm the Director of Public Services for the Carroll County Public Library. And uh, we are so grateful this evening to uh, welcome author Tom Clavin, who is uh, uh, joining us uh, for, this, for this author talk. Uh, Tom Clavin is a number one New York Times bestselling author and he, and he has worked as a newspaper editor, magazine writer, TV and radio commentator, and a reporter for the New York Times. He has received awards from the Society of Professional Journalists, Marine Corps Heritage Foundation, and National Newspaper Association. His books include the best-selling Frontier Lawman Trilogy, Wild Bill, Dodge City, and Tombstone, and Blood, and, and Blood and Treasure, with his co-author, Tom Drury. His most recent book is Lightning Down, a World War II story of survival. He lives in Sag Harbor, New York. This evening's program is co-presented uh, with a Likely Story bookstore and uh, with the Carroll County Public Library. Purchased signed copies of Tom's book are available from a Likely Story bookstore, which you can reach at sykesvillebooks.com. And at this point, we'll turn things over to you, Tom. We'd love to hear about the book. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, the, the folks at the Carroll County Library and a Likely Story for uh, inviting me to, to give this talk. Um, uh, Lightning Down just came out on Tuesday, uh, so people are still learning about it, discovering it. Uh, uh, I'm getting it's starting. It's being reviewed at, at, in various outlets, and and it's very satisfying to me. The main character is Joe Moser, and it's very satisfying to me when the reviews are saying something like, "Yeah, you know, of course it's nice if they say they like the book." but they, they really get to care about the main character because Joe Bozer was a real person. This is not a novel. This is nonfiction. Um, so let me go back to the beginning. Uh, and I mention this because um, I think it shows how wonderful curiosity is. I think if one of the things I'm most grateful for in my life is I was born curious. And, um, and in this case, back in December, 2015, I was researching another project and I just happened to stumble across um, a, an obituary for a gentleman named Joe Moser. And the obituary was in a Washington, state of Washington weekly newspaper, local weekly. He had just died at age 94. And it said, it was a pretty routine uh, obituary. He talked about his survivors, survivors, widow, whatever. Uh, what he do, he's an oil burner repair, repairman. And, uh, but it said he was one of 170 Allied pilots. Uh, who survived being incarcerated in Buchenwald. And uh, that got my curiosity going because uh, I'm not a history expert by any means, but I have dealt with a lot of American history topics. And I, I, I have, um, uh, with my, my co-author, Bob Drury, we've done Halsey's Typhoon, Lucky 666, both books also about World War II. I'd never heard of something like this before. So I, uh, I decided to look into it and if you do the math, you know, next month it'll be six years since I did that obituary, saw that obituary. And, um, you know, partly uh, uh, that the reason for that length of time is because I was uh, working on other projects. I have to work on another project, come back to this one, work on another project. So, but over time I got to, I guess, pull some threads and find out more about the story, which included contacting Joe Moses' family, uh, who were very helpful to me. And those of you who, We'll get a chance to read the book. We'll see in the photo section that there are a number of photos that they were generous enough to give to me that are from their personal Moser family collection. Um, and basically, the story that I found out is I'm going to tell you as concisely as possible. Uh, going back to Joe Moser, he was born and raised on a farm in Washington State, mostly a dairy farm. And uh, when he'd be out in the fields, uh, working with his father later on after his father passed away he became as an adolescent the sort of the man of the family he would see planes flying overhead and uh he would sometimes dream about wouldn't it be wonderful if i was a pilot you know instead of instead of milking this cow or instead of plowing this field i wish i was a pilot i certainly had seemed more romanticized and uh but then pearl harbor happened and like thousands and thousands of young men uh his age he's he believe i believe he was just uh, just turned 19 or something like that. He enlisted. 
I enlisted in the army with the idea of could I actually be selected for the army uh, air corps training program and he was and so uh he had to go through uh i think we might have a slide there of, of joe moser when he was there he is as, as a trainee um and he's first learning the ropes about how to fly and then he goes through uh really like at least 18 months if not longer of training um and you know he was anxious to get overseas uh you know he knew that, that that's where the fight was in, in europe but he was especially for him and uh it took a while not because there's anything wrong with him but because of the very rigorous he he was not only going to be a, a combat pilot he was going to fly a p-38 lightning which was a rather sophisticated aircraft for the time and it could it doubled as both a light bomber and a uh, attack plane as a, as a, uh, a fighter so uh, he finally got his wings. And I think we have a slide showing Joe in his uh, uniform as a newly christened uh, second lieutenant. There he is. <laughs> and uh, uh, Joe's squadron in the spring of 1944 was shipped over to England. And from there, um, they would go on these missions. Uh, sometimes the missions, many times initially, the missions would be to escort bombers who were going into France and sometimes into as far as Germany itself to bomb uh, factories, railroad yards, uh, enemy positions that they knew about, artillery sites, anything like that. And um, I'm trying to remember, do we have a, a slide of the P-38 Lightning itself? That one in there? There it is. You can see what an unusual plane this is, and I won't go into it now, but in the book there's a little more detail about how Lockheed created and built this plane. You can see it's 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 different from the typical you know certainly airplane fighter craft that would, was employed in World War II, um, but it was a very effective long range and fuel. I, again, I won't go into I won't wonk you out with all the details, but Joe loved this plane. He loved flying the P thirty eight, and uh, by the by uh, the summer of uh, nineteen forty four, they had relocated their air base. He was in the four twenty ninth Fighter Squadron. Uh, from England to France because it was uh, sufficiently after D-Day that they had made enough inroads in, in France to act, establish a new base there. And I think what's kind of remarkable is that uh, by August 13, 1944, uh, Joe was, uh, he's, he's still only 22 years old, but he was on his 44th combat mission. And that's significant for a couple of reasons. It shows uh, how often he was called upon to go up there and either do escort bombing runs or, or be an attack plane and hunt other hunt Luftwaffe or, or planes. Um, but if he had, if he he needed fifty missions to be rotated back home, and the concept of home uh, and family plays a very important role in this book. Uh, he, you know, a big mantra, if you could use that word for him was he wanted to get back to his widowed mother and his younger brother and two younger sisters. And that's one of the things that inspired him. I'll do the best I can because I'm fighting for my country and I care about that, but I want to do the best I can because I want to get home. No matter what, I'm going to get home. And I want to go home feeling proud of what I did. So on August 13, 1944, he's on his 44th mission and his plane gets hit by enemy fire. And it goes, it goes on fire, and uh, Joe is trying to bail out of the plane, and uh, one of the first, uh, uh, or maybe the first major cliffhanger in the book is that he has a lot of trouble bailing out of his plane. His boot gets stuck in the cockpit, and this plane is going down <laughs> and, and over France. But he manages to extricate himself just in the nick of time. The plane crashes into a farm field and explodes. Joe is got, got out with his parachute. And the uh, several French farmers try to help him hide in a nearby uh, wooded area. But before he can reach the area, uh, he and the two young French farmers who were trying to who were running with him to show him where to go uh, were caught by the Germans. The Germans had seen the smoke, they heard the explosion. They showed up. Uh, Joe was, was taken prisoner. Also, the two young French farmers were taken prisoner. And that night, Joe was kept in a sort of like a cellar kind of place. And the next morning, the two young farmers were taken out. And, and a few minutes later, Joe hears gunshots. And for most of the rest of his life, that he would be tortured by this because he assumed 
that these two young men had been put up against the wall and shot. So let me leave that right there for now. Uh, Joe was transferred to the Fresne pr prison, which is outside of Paris, a, a place of uh, unbelievable cruelty. Uh, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people were kept in this prison in terrible conditions. They were beaten, they were tortured, interrogated, uh, sometimes just simply executed. And uh, that's where Joe finds out because of all things, he runs into his former commanding officer who had been missing in action for a couple of months. And he's overjoyed to see his former commanding officer, but that's when he finds out that he and his commanding officer are two of 170, I mean, the specific number is 168, allied pilots who are being kept illegally in this prison outside of Paris. Um, as most people would expect from to reading books about the war, uh, television shows, movies. If you're a captured uh, fighter, uh, you're sent to a POW camp, and that's where you remain until you manage to escape or your camp is liberated and the, the war is ending. But they instead were kept in this prison, which was mostly for um, French resistance fighters, uh, uh, captured Polish and other national uh, soldiers, uh, gypsies. Uh, homosexuals, uh, uh, other people who were considered undesirables, which were most of our, most everybody who was not a Nazi uh, at this prison. And uh, who knows how long he would have been there, but it was at that time in mid-August that the Allies were getting close to Paris. So one morning, Joe and about 2,000 others are put on these cattle cars, in these cramped cattle cars with just a bucket of water among them. Uh, they were packed in so tightly that even if you passed out, you couldn't fall to the floor of the cattle car. Every, every, so, and for five days and night, uh, this, this train was making its way east. It kept going, kept going. They went through France. They entered Germany. Uh, the men had, in these horrendous conditions they were in, had absolutely no idea where they were going. And then when the train finally stopped, uh, came to its destination, and the cattle cars were thrown, thrown open, and these men were forced uh, on, on, if they were still alive, they, some had died during the journey, uh, out of the cattle cars, they saw that, they, they assumed they had finally arrived at a POW camp, but they saw this very strange kind of series of buildings and compound. And what really uh, startled them the most is they would see staring at them from the other side of the fence would be these walking skeletons, these people that were barely clothed, uh, thin, emaciated, uh, obviously some of them terribly sick. And they were wondering, this can't be a POW camp. And it finally dawned on a few of them that they were at a Nazi camp and they saw that it was Buchenwald. And they were processed. Um, I think you might have, not sure if this is the next slide, but there might be uh, a letter that went to uh, Joe Moses' mother and also, oh no, that's, that's, that's his part of his squadron of 429th. That's, that's Joe on the lower left, sort of squatting there uh, next, next to a, one, of his, one of his other officers. Um, but I think there might be a slide of uh, Joe. Yeah, okay, the, on the left here is the inside the Fresne prison. Uh, then you can see the entrance to Buchenwald and one of the most uh, uh, worst aspects, if not the worst aspect of Buchenwald, a lot of things that were vying for that dishonor, uh, was the crematorium. And they, uh, uh, Joe had his photo taken. I think that might be the next slide you have there. Uh, yes, there he is. It's a mate. Oh, oh, go back, go back. Uh, <laughs> there he is. Uh, so that's a picture that was taken of Joe when he was processed at the, at the Buchenwald camp. And, um, why you ask, I'm assuming you're asking, why were these flyers not sent to a POW camp and sent to Buchenwald? And uh, you know, to briefly explain that, by the middle of 1944, uh, the German government uh, could see that the war was starting to turn against them, and they did some desperate things. One of them was that they decreed that anybody who was found trying to help a downed flyer escape would be executed, and the flyer would be was considered a terrorist. Uh, and so didn't the Geneva Convention did not apply. They were falsely accused of war crimes and they were sent to Buchenwald. And the idea was they would just die. Uh, and once they died, they'd be thrown in the ovens. Nobody would ever know that they were there, that they even existed. 
So uh, they had to find a way, once they got found out what their situation was, to not die. Uh, the, the conditions were, as the book goes in greater detail, uh, hardly any food, sickness was rampant. You can see the these poor fellows here, the, the weight loss. I mean, Joe himself went down to 105 pounds. Now, I should mention, if we go to the next uh, page of slides, Nope, go back, go back. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, on the left is the letter that went to Joe Mosu's mother informing her that her son was missing in action. Now, every day after that, every week after that, every month after that, that she didn't hear any further word, she became more despairing because she believed that, that Joe had died and, and she would never see her, her oldest child again. Uh, the man in the middle is a Colonel Philip Limeson. He was with the New Zealand Air Force. He was one of those downed pilots, and it was determined once the group got their bearings that he was the senior officer among them. So he took command. And he said, what we have to do is we have to stick together. We have to eat together. We have to march together. We have to do everything together and maintain discipline as if we were back on our base where we flew from. Because that's the way we have the best chance of, of living, of, of enduring what were the terrible things we're enduring. I mean, when they got to Buchenwald, there wasn't even a place, so overcrowded, they had no place to put them. These, they, their barracks was a stone courtyard. That's what they slept on. It uh, didn't matter what the weather was like. It could be raining. It could be got, started to get cold in the nights of September, October. That's what they slept on. Um, so Colonel Lamison also not only inspired the men by his words, but by his deeds. When the Germans, uh, the Nazi guards came to him and said, okay, you, you're gonna, your men are going to start working in the factory next door making munitions to use against your own people. He said, no, we don't do that. We refuse. Uh, he was beaten. He was, he was threatened with a, by a German shepherd attack dogs. Um, uh, at any moment, a trigger could have been pulled that would have killed him. But he defied the, the, the Nazi guards. Um, the guy on the right there is, uh, is Heinrich Himmler. Um, his claim to infamy is that uh, in addition to being a close associate for many years of Adolf Hitler, he was the one that was head of the SS. And the SS were the ones that controlled the concentration camps. And there's an interesting distinction there because the Luftwaffe controlled the camps, POW camps where po captured pilots were kept and where they did observe the Geneva, conditions weren't great there either, but they did observe the Geneva Convention at the Nazi concentration camps there was no such thing as that it was just cruelty after cruelty uh the guards could decide if they felt like it to just kill somebody either by with their bare hands if they wanted to or or use it use a bullet or whatever means they had available uh the food consisted of a bear some some soup that the protein with the maggots in the soup some bread that was inedible teeth would your teeth would fall out trying to eat it so uh it was also uh, Buchenwald officially was a not a death camp, not like Auschwitz, for example, but a labor camp. And if you show the next slide, uh, what that me meant was that people had to go out and work every day, whatever the task was, a stone quarry, building a road, whatever it was. And uh, they, um, uh, you might think, okay, that's not as bad as a death camp, right? A labor camp. But the thing is, the conditions were so horrendous because of disease and malnutrition that they were Thousands of people were literally worked to death. Uh, they would either die during the work itself or they would die in their barracks at night and be found dead the next morning. Uh, you can see in the upper right corner there, these were the, 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 finally the pilots were able to get some barracks where they had these little bunks that they could sleep in. Um, I won't tell, talk about things like what they had to use for latrine facilities. I don't want to uh, make, it, make it worse for people at, at, around dinner time. Uh, that lower right uh, photograph shows the commandant of Buchenwald and his senior officers having a chat while in the background, uh, the prisoners every morning and every evening had to do a roll call. Sometimes it would be for hours because they wanted to check to see who was missing. It would actually call people's names and had to answer to it. And um, many times that's how they discovered they, they would discover somebody tried to escape, which was very close to being impossible. But they also would find out who is not there because they figured, okay, that person probably died. So let's go get the body. And you put it on these carts. And these carts would move around the camp collecting bodies and bring them to the crematorium. Um, so day after day went by, week after week went by, 
and uh, Joe and the pilots are trying to hang on, uh, sharing the little food that they had, uh, protecting each other from the guards. And it became inconvenient for the German government that they, I mean, not every, all of them survived, but the majority of them were not dying in a time fat, timely fashion. So finally, let's do go to the next slide. I want to see what where we are now, if you could. Ah, okay, I'll get to that in, in, in just a minute. Um, finally, Adolf Hitler uh, gave the order to the Commandant of Buchenwald to execute the flyers, all of them, uh, just uh, however many were left of the original 170, uh, whatever means they wanted to, put them up against the wall, hang them, whatever means, just execute them. Because the German government became increasingly aware that word would get out that they had done this to pilots, which could have an effect on their pilots who were prisoners of war. Uh, and obviously, too, that there would be a ter very serious war crime that could come back to haunt any number of these high-ranking German officials. So Hitler said, kill them. And uh, the execution date was set. And uh, Colonel Lamison was desperately trying to find a way to stop the execution. And he, he, and, he and a couple other, a couple others, uh, other um, prisoners who were trying to help the pilots came up with the equivalent of a Hail Mary pass. And now this is where I won't, but this is where a couple of talks that I've given, I've said, well, if you want to find out what happens if they get executed or not, read the book. But I'm not going to do that because I want to go because that would give the impression that the book ends when they're, when they're incarceration of Buchenwald ends. And that's not the case at all. Um, they do a Hail Mary pass. They compose a note in German that somebody sneaks to the nearby German Luftwaffe air base. And miraculously, it finally makes it into the hands of a band named Hannes Trotloff. He was not only a, a current high-ranking officer of the Luftwaffe, but he was a German ace. He was a hero in Germany uh, for all the, all the uh, combats he had won in the air against the allies over the years. So his, his, uh, his credentials, for example, were impeccable. And he gets this note and he is shocked that could there really be enemy pilots being kept at a concentration camp? So he decides that he and his adjutant under some pretense, they're gonna inspect something at, at Buchenwald to, to give, be given an inspection tour. And because of his credentials, he can't be refused. Even, even the commandant of Buchenwald has to answer to him. So they take him on this inspection tour, and he's kept being steered away from where the pilots are are looking on. And of course, they've been threatened that if they if they say anything, they'll be shot. Um, but what the heck? They're going to be shot anyway. So finally, when the, when the colonel he can't tell the prisoners from the pilots from other prisoners because by this point. They all look the same. They're gaunt, emaciated, skeleton, walking skeletons. Uh, they, you know, the haunted eyes. Uh, but as he's about to leave, thinking, I guess that note was false. Uh, one of them calls out, "Here we are! Here we are! Come talk to us!" And uh, he, he immediately, you know, does an about face and comes back and addresses the pilots. So the secrets, the SS officers are trying to get him out of there, almost pushing him out of there. But he, you know, he, he outranks them. They can't, they can't touch him. Get away from me. And so he has a conversation with these pilots and when he discovers that this is absolutely true and the condition that they're in, he's absolutely appalled. He leaves, he goes back to his base and he's gonna go right to the top. He has a relationship because again, he's an ace and a hero with Hermann Goring, who is the head of the Luftwaffe. Now, Hermann Goring was, was a monster. Uh, you know, he's one of the most despicable people in European history. However, he was equally shocked. You know, there's like this code of honor among pilots. You don't do this to enemy pilots. Uh, he was equally, he was shocked that he, he issued an order to the commandant of Buchenwald to re, not to release these prisoners, but to put them on a train to a POW camp. So yes, they that happens. They, they survive Buchenwald. Um, they are sent to a POW camp. They're gonna be there for a while. Uh, it's the conditions are very bad there, but they're not Buchenwald. You know, they start to put out a few pounds. There's a little more food. Very, very important is they have access to Red Cross packages and Red Cross personnel. And it's because of the access to the Red Cross personnel, this telegram, this Western Union telegram 
is sent to Joe's mother, Mary Moser, back in Washington, it arrives on Thanksgiving Day, telling her that her son is alive. And I don't know how she didn't collapse at that moment, but obviously she had a lot to be thankful for that day to find out that her child was, was, had not been killed, but it was alive. Um, so there is kind of like the good news there in a POW camp, but the bad news is that when it gets to be the end of January, with the Russians approaching from the, from the east and the allies approaching from the west, a decision is made that they're going to take the ten, this terribly overcrowded uh, prisoner of war camp, uh, 10,000 prisoners in it, and they're going to march them to a railroad station that will take them deeper into Germany to another prisoner of war camp. Now, the winter, that, that particular winter of early 1945 was one of the most brutal on record. And here you have these prisoners are basically sent out into this winter to march to the railroad station, which is dozens of miles away. It's not like they have to march down the street. It ended up being known as the death march because of those 10,000 prisoners, 1,300 died on this death march. And one of them who's part of this march is Joe Moser. And they are going hour after hour, day after day, one foot in front of the other. And if you'll indulge me, I want to make sure that I, I, I uh, do this the right way because this is a climactic moment in the book. You know, you'd think that it wasn't just that it was just Buchenwald we're talking about here. Um, it's, it's short, it's just a couple of paragraphs, if you'll, if you'll indulge me. Um, this is Joe's experience on this, on this death march. One mile, two, one after that, frozen and exhausted men shuffled forward. Every so often, one dropped, and a guard would drag the prisoner to the side of the road, out of the way. Sometimes a gunshot would follow, sometimes a bullet was not necessary. The hint of the sun through the clouds was directly overhead, and then it crawled through the cruel afternoon. Joe idly wondered which step would be his last, when he would finally find it impossible to put one foot in front of the other, when he would fall to his knees and then pitch forward to his face. And then a guard, perhaps with an ounce of sympathy, but probably only with, with a heavy weariness, would, would hand him off to the, would drag him off to the side of the road. However, as though a miracle was occurring, Later in the afternoon, Joe began to feel better. It was like he had broken through to the other side of pain and exhaustion. He experienced a growing warmth and with it a growing sense of well-being. Something deep inside of him seemed to be saying that he was going to be okay. He was going to go home and it would feel so good. That feeling expanded within him. Now I'm quoting from Joe himself. What started as a surprising sense of acceptance and peace slowly began turning to a kind of euphoria. The snow and cold and wind seemed to fill me with a kind of joy and anticipation. It was almost as if I was outside myself, watching myself getting warmer, more peaceful, and even joyful. It seemed the sky was lightning. It didn't seem so hard now. I could go on like this forever, forever and ever. Joe was not aware that the euphoria was the sensation experienced by those about to die from the combination of hypothermia and exhaustion. After a few more unsteady steps, darkness flooded his mind and he collapsed. A final thought was that, was that his fear of being left to die on a lonely road in a country thousands of miles from home was about to be realized. Well, now I can tell you if you want to find out what happens to Joe Moser and if he survives and what happens after that, you have to read the book. So um, if we could do a couple more of the slides there, I'd like to sort of not go on too long and you know, keep things for print. Now, obviously, I gave the story away when I what happened to Joe Moser when I started my talk and I said I had been his obituary at 94. Uh, and that's when I think the last photograph the family gave me is the very last photograph taken of Joe Moser, who was extremely active uh, right up until his last day uh, when he died in December 2015. But how he got to that point, the, you know, how he survived, miraculously survived, not freezing to death in the snow, and also how he survived the next camp he was in, which was almost as bad as Buchenwald until it was liberated, in April 1945, and then how he, all the difficulties, how he eventually got home and what was waiting for him at home, that's all still part of the story to be told in Lightning Down. So I want to stop there, and hopefully uh, some of the people who have been kind enough to uh, to watch and listen will have a few questions. 
<laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, before we came on, I, I neglected to tell, mention to you that that you you well, I, I just wanted to reference something you talked about at the very beginning yeah. about the that sort of the complicated structure of the P thirty eight Lightning. Yes. I remember as a kid making a model of a P thirty eight Lightning and not really knowing what it looked like and just finding it so complicated with the yes. sort of the dual fuselage and the, yes. and the big tail at the end. Yeah, the yeah. The tail. yeah, yeah. It, it is a, a unique looking plane and Lockheed manufactured thousands of them during the war. They cranked them out as fast as they could because they were, they were a, an especially useful and effective weapon against, against both in the Pacific and European theaters. Well, I, I do want to ask you why you decided to to tell this story. Why did you think it was important to to tell the story? You know, I think a couple of reasons. One was that the more I learned about Joe Moser, unfortunately, because I learned of him through his obituary, I never had the, the pleasure or the privilege to meet him. But the more I learned about Joe Moser, the more I wanted other people to know what a remarkable person he was and how startling his experiences were. And I think the other reason is that, you know, um, next month it'll be the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. So that means that we are 80 years from when the war began, 76 years from when the war ended. And you would think by now there are no more untold stories. Whatever stories was left to find about World War II, we have found them by now. But this was one that really hadn't been you know, I'm not saying people, of course, some people knew about this story, especially the family members who or people who experienced it. But for the most part, for a general audience, who knew that, you know, down pilots had to endure, uh, you know, the, the secrecy and, and cruelty of Buchenwald and that many of them, not all of them, but many of them survived. So I couldn't shake the story. I couldn't over the past six years shake my connection to Joe Moser and also the desire to tell the story. And, and this next question, you've you've somewhat answered it already. You said you came across the obituary, but um, the the question is, you know, which came to you first? Did you have the interest in sharing the experience of the World War II flyers who were imprisoned in the concentration camps, or Joe's specific story? So maybe we could ask, how did you come across Joe's obituary? Well, I, I was researching something else, and um, I, I, I probably. A book Bob Drury and I did that came out in 2016 was called Lucky 666, and it was about a B-17 bomber crew in the Pacific. So I was probably plugged into, you know, Google or whatever, something about World War II pilots. Uh, I'm sure something more specific than that was what I was put, plugging in there. And then by some kind of great good luck, you know, one of the things that came up on the screen was the obituary of Joe Moser. And... That started me on a journey of really telling two stories that were deeply connected. One was uh, the family was kind enough to share with me some of the uh, uh, writings that Joe had done uh, in his 80s. He decided with a friend named Gerald Barron to write down some of his experiences. So uh, I had access to that. So I so I was telling a story about Joe, Joe the individual and his individual he was like the guide into the larger story, which was a lot of other independent research about not just Joe, but but people like Philip Lamison, people like Colonel Troutloff, the, the, the Luftwaffe officer who helped them get out of uh, Buchenwald. Um, the, the, the history of Buchenwald and, and how it differed from the other Nazi concentration camps and some of the figures who were most notorious in, in Buchenwald. So there is a larger story that uh, I had to expand on and, and research separately, but Joe was was really my my traveler, my my guide into into the larger story. Yeah, I I almost sense because I'm named Joe too. I sensed that he was sort of like an avatar for for the reader in in a way that you know I could I could I could easily identify with his experience. So I really appreciated the way you wrote him as a as a character. Yeah, thanks. Um, in the introduction to the biography at the end, you state that the, the work by Eugene Kogan is indispensable to anyone who begins to feel complacent about the presence of fascism and evil in the world. Um, and the question is, do you feel that there are any particular places in the world that this applies most that maybe deserve more attention? Well, you know, where every so often, I, 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 I'm not, and again, a historian might disagree with me, 
uh, certainly anything, nothing in my lifetime uh, compares to the staggering evil and um, the large scale ugly evil of the Nazis. Um, however, during my lifetime, there have been instances of brutal dictatorships, uh, fascist governments, uh, suppression of, of basic rights of people, uh, people being executed, uh, dying from the most uh, atrocious conditions in their country. Um, you know, the, um, uh, so we, we, what Eugene Kogan, just to expand a little bit on your question, Eugene Kogan was an inmate at Buchenwald and he was a, he worked with a doctor in Buchenwald who did exper you, you know, terrible experiments on people and was responsible for hundreds if not thousands of deaths. And thankfully Eugene Kogan survived Buchenwald and he was able to testify against uh, war criminals who were arrested and those who survived. <clears throat> and then he, he, he wrote a book about his uh, experiences at Buchenwald, which is gr very detailed. And I think, you know, I, I, the only, it's, a, it's a tough read, obviously, because it catalogs uh, all the, many of the awful and disgusting things the Nazis did in these, in these concentration camps. But it's also indispensable because uh, I'd like to think that people who become more aware of what happened to these, these concentration camps it makes it less likely that anything like that is going to happen again. Um, you know, I, I get deeply disturbed whenever I hear about uh, a fascist government, a dictatorship, a totalitarian regime, and, and um, you know, the t genocide and things like that. The Rohingya, for example, has, has been in the news a lot quite a bit. Um, so I think that, you know, the accounts of people like Eugene Kogan are, are really necessary. You know, they say never forget. Well, Lightning down is is just one small contribution to the idea of let's we can never forget what the Nazis did. I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm not hearing you. Sorry, Tom, I've muted myself. <laughs> But that's what, what you just said there is it's a good lead into the next question we have here. And that's, you know, in addition to the books you've listed in the, the biography, you know, are there any movies you'd recommend for someone interested in wanting to know more about either the life of the World War II flyers who were captured or uh, those who experienced the concentration camps or the POW camps for that matter? And, you know, what, what movies, whether they be fiction or nonfiction, um, you know, do you think tell these stories well? You know, I don't, I'm not aware that there's, um, looking strictly at, uh, at allied uh, personnel, whatever they were, Air Force or infantry or whatever, uh, who were incarcerated in POW camps, it's really hard to find anything that depict the experience of that camps accurately. Um, I mean, uh, something like Stalag 13, uh, which was made in the early 1950s, you get some sense of that. You also get some sense of that in the movie The Great Escape, which I think was made in 1965. In fact, the prisoner of war camp that Joe was sent to after Buchenwald is where The Great Escape took place. So there's, there's some of that about that that story in, in Lightning Down. Uh, and then you get things like Hogan's Heroes, uh, which was a, a television show that was a comedy about life life of American prisoners at a, at a POW camp. So... It's hard to find that as far as as the brutality of the Nazi death camps. I mean, the immediate ones that come to mind are Spielberg Schindler's List. You know, the documentary show up uh, is uh, uh, and I, I, I watched some of these and other documentaries uh, that that are, are rough watching. Um, and I guess. Part of the power of them is that you can watch them and it doesn't get, I certainly didn't get numb to them. Like seeing seeing dead bodies and, and the prisoners and everything. Um, I mean, I, I had to do it because I wanted to educate myself better. And thankfully, I felt just as sickened by it, you know, after hours of watching these documentaries as I did when I began. Well, um, we, we, we'd like to know now, we were talking a little bit before the the, uh, your your presentation 
that you're now working on something else, it sounds like. Are you willing to talk about what you're researching and, and writing about next? Yeah, I'm working on, on two books that are thankfully quite different um, because, um, well, it just helps to have two different books. If you're working on two books, have, best to have them be different. You're less likely to mix things up. But I have another book that I'm working on with Bob Drury. We have done seven books together, and, and some of your uh, readers of uh, a likely story might be familiar with the, the last one we did, which was called Blood and Treasure, Daniel Boone and the Fight for America's First Frontier, which came out in April. And as it is, Bob, the book that Bob and I are working on is, is a World War II story about the 2nd Ranger Battalion uh, and, and, and a uh, kind of an overlooked uh, battle uh, called the Battle for Hill 400, which was a, it's sort of like a pork chop hill, World War II version of pork chop hill, which was a Korean battle. Uh, and the reason why it has tended to get overlooked is right after this battle ended and the 2nd Rangers had basically held this hill against repeated counterattacks, the Battle of the Bulge began. And that got, that's gotten all the oxygen of that period of early, of December 1944 on the, on the, uh, the Allied front. And then my next solo book that I'm working on is uh, a story about, uh, again, most people don't know about it, but I'm returning to the, to the West, the frontier, uh, about how in 1875, a rather bold, one would say insane, company of Texas Rangers invaded Mexico. And and uh, it's it's a bit of a so it reminds me a bit of movies like Major Dundee or some of these others, um, and and how, why did they invade Mexico? Uh, what did they do when they learned that they were vastly outnumbered by the Mexican army, and were trapped in the Rio Grande River? And what happened to them? And so that's the that's the next solo project I'm working on. Well, it sounds sounds like you've got a lot to occupy your time there. We we do have a question. What what do you like to read do you have any favorite authors or books and maybe what are you reading right now you know i have to do so much reading for my work that when it comes time to what i could just read something for myself uh i like to read uh uh thrillers uh you know because i i i i, I, I I've, in the past year i've been rereading uh the travis mcgee series by john d mcdonald uh some of my favorite i mean my, my my favorite author is james lee burke uh i think he's an absolutely brilliant writer um I, I, he sets most of his books in new orleans uh i like uh, uh cj box and his, his picket series i just finished the second to the last book by craig johnson and his walt Long, sheriff walt longmire series uh, John Sanford and his Davenport and Virgil Flowers series, <laughs> uh, Ian Rankin and his Inspector Rebus series. So I do tend to follow series for years and years and years and years and years. And it's a great um, escape for me to leave the, a war behind or leave some other uh, situation behind. Uh, and and, and, and I, I reunite with old friends. You know, I reunite with Lucas Davenport. I reunite with with Joe Pickett in Wyoming. Uh, I, I reunite uh, with uh, with Harry Bosch in Los Angeles in the Michael Connolly series, and and that's that's it recharges my batteries, and then I'm back into the fray. Well, thank thank you for sharing some of what you're reading. As a as a library and a bookstore, we're always interested in readers' yeah. advisory and getting yeah. getting suggestions and recommendations. Uh, we we do have a question here. Um, if you were to describe a, a place that maybe people would want to visit um, to travel to now that hopefully we can travel a little bit more now that, that you feel like helps um, give the experience of, of what Joe might have gone through. Like, can you think of anywhere that you'd recommend maybe making a visit to? Well, for better or for worse, uh, some of the more infamous concentration camps you can visit. I mean, people can visit Buchenwald. Uh, they, they, I believe they could visit Auschwitz. Uh, and of course, the reason why, I mean, you would think, okay, why didn't they just destroy these purses and, 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 and bulldoze them into the ground? But they're also, they're, 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 again, they're a way of never forgetting. And also, they're teaching opportunities for people to visit them. And if I can segue a bit from that question, um, I talk about in Lightning Down how the different reactions some of the surviving pilots had when years later 
they revisited Buchenwald. Not all of them could could stand could bear to do it, but some of them did, and some found it a liberating experience that freed them from some of the ghosts uh, inside of them. Some found that they it was it was they made a mistake that it brought it haunted them again to see even even the sanitized buildings and, and compound uh, to see that. Uh, and I should mention that Joe Moser uh, was one of those. Um, it took him decades to reconcile what his experiences were. In fact, Joe, it was not till the 1980s that he told his wife and children he had been a book of all. He was, Joe was, uh, I think, 80, 88, 89. And you would think that's not the best age to be traveling overseas to Europe. But he went back to Buchenwald. He took a daughter, I think a nephew with him, a couple of daughters. And uh, he, it was a good experience for him because, it, 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 this sounds strange, but he felt like his experience transformed him into a better person. And it made him appreciate even more his family his country his his humanity his neighbors his community uh and also this is going to sound tr strange too but uh lightning down a lot of ways is a book where where love plays a very important role you wouldn't think that because i'm writing about brutality and sadism and evil but uh joe attributes his wartime experiences to making him a more loving human being and there, the word love appears more in the last 40 pages of the book than the, than the previous 260 pages by far. And that's how I came to view the book, too, as I was working on it. It's very much about, about love uh, and, and, and what he came out on the other side of the most horrendous experiences, a better person. And he even, you know, I have him quoted in the book as saying this. And I sort of give this away in case the readers don't get it by this point. The book is a prologue, four sections, and an epilogue. Every the prologue and every section begins with an epigram, a quote. And I, I give it away. The epigram for the epilogue is from Voltaire's Candide. I mean, Joe is my Candide. He goes off to seek adventure and eventually finds out, come, come home and tend your own garden. Come home. That's where you belong. And the quote from, from Candide is, it's love, tender love, basically, that makes the world a, a place that's tolerable. And so uh, this might be a very strange thing to hear the author say, but but I was very aware as I was writing it, especially the last section of the book uh, and the epilogue, that uh, that this is this is a book about somebody who becomes a, a more of a loving person than he than he ever thought he could be. Well, it's a a fascinating book. It's a it's an important book. And uh, Tom, we really appreciate you taking time to spend with us this evening, and we wish you good luck on your your book tour. So uh, please, please check out a copy at your local library, uh, place it on hold, or or uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of the the program, make a purchase from a Likely Story bookstore where you can get a signed copy. So if you missed it at the beginning, you'll want to check out. Uh, go to SykesvilleBooks.com, and those signed copies are available there. Yeah, Tom, I can, I just, any, I, any final words? Yeah. I can mention real quickly. Um, I, I think people found out in the last 18 months, if uh, e even more than they might have realized that before, how important independent lo the local bookstores are. Uh, because, you know, when, when, when they started to reopen and people could get their books and bookstores and libraries, I feel this way about libraries too, who have been very helpful to me in my, my career, their communities. Each bookstore and each library is its own community in a way. You go to borrow a book, you're going to run into people you know. You're going to talk to the library personnel. Uh, you're going to talk to the people who work at a likely story and other bookstores. They, they become communities. And, and thank goodness that um, we discovered again how important both libraries and bookstores are, uh, unfortunately, because <laughs> it was during a pandemic. So, yes, please support your local bookstore. Thank you, Tom. And uh, I think that's all the questions we have at this point. So we hope you have a great evening. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time. Great. Thanks so much. Take care. Take care, everyone.